for asking me along to pontificate this evening. Um, a great honour, and um, I gather from Paul that I am following in significant wake uh, behind Catherine and Alison. So that's a, that's a it's a double whammy, really. I shall have to be very careful what I say this evening. Um, without more ado, I am going to launch into, I hope, into my um, PowerPoint. Um, yes, I am. Excellent. Right. Um, I decided that really this should have a subtitle and um, it's very tricky speaking to a computer. I hope you can all hear me and uh, this is getting through to you. But anyway, um, you haven't shared your screen yet. Have I not? Right. OK, hold on one second. Right, good. We're there. Yes, we are. Yes, excellent. Okay, let's uh, let's go back. Good. Right. Um, I decided maybe I should have a slightly more inspiring title than Tracy Shepherd Glass Engraver, which is a bit flat, really. So I've um, I've gone for an I've gone for an alliterative title, uh, which sort of sums up. Um, the three different areas that I that I've come to to um, work in over the last 40 odd years. Um, I started engraving in 1979, so I've been at it for a while. And I began with uh, drill engraving, studying with Josephine Harris uh, at an evening class. I'm not going to get too much involved in the history because we haven't got long this evening and I don't want to um, go on and on and on about um, past history. But this is my workshop. Uh, in Winchester and as you can see I've got a, a very um, distracting view of the garden which is uh, great at this time of year because it means I can keep slipping out and doing things which uh, take me away from the bench. Um, it doesn't usually look this tidy and um, I have had a bit of a clear up especially for you. Um, my bench is uh, an old altar table which I came upon. Uh, it's extremely stable and it's got a fantastic stretcher so I've got somewhere to rest my feet when I'm not working. And uh, my trusty black cushion, I have a micromotor which is hiding here, small dental mo micromotor. Uh, I have an extractor which takes the dust away at source and I have a magnificent array of burrs some of which I use infrequently and some of which I use most of the time. So um, let's just have a little look. Generally speaking, I like to start with a very careful drawing onto the glass. And um, this is just a, 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 a for instance, this is my sketchbook. Um, so you can see I, when I have time, I do make some fairly careful pencil studies. And then those are translated using spirit based pen onto a vessel. Um, and I can play around with the, with the spirit based pen, get it exactly as I want it before I start to um, run away with the drill. And there's a little tiny close up. You can see how much dust is generated. You can see that I'm working um, within the within the ink drawing. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, these are my tools. Unlike Catherine, I don't have I don't have spindles and and um, pastes and things. I have uh, a selection of dental repurposed tools and they fall into three categories. I have stones, uh, diamonds and polishers and um, they come in different grades, they come in different shapes and uh, they all have applications and they can all get muddled up, mixed up and used in different, um, different combinations. Um, as a general rule of thumb, the stones are the tools which I use to remove the surface of the glass in the first instance to fix the design onto the glass. This um, also gives me a key for the rest of the tools to grab hold of. Um, I also use them to do some basic modelling and um, then I switch over to diamonds, which are brilliant for detail and for tidying up and for fine lettering. And then these polishers are the things which I use to um, reintroduce the tone into the glass. So smooth it back in essence to give myself tones of grey through to black. And again, they come in different grades and different sizes and each has a slightly different application. Um, 
with just a very, very quick one, two, three, just so that you can see the general processes that I use. Um, this is a little tiny study of a viola. It's about the size of my thumbnail, so actually really quite small. And this is obscenely enlarged, but at least it shows you the, the, the way that the tool is marking the surface. This is what's called stoning out. This is where I'm removing the top surface of the glass within the design. Um, taking the stone, generally speaking, in the direction of the growth, of whatever I'm engraving, um, and this applies to architecture as well, so I'm following the brick courses, that sort of thing. So it's sort of a bit like putting down a watercolour wash, a basis to work on. And I maintain my drawing by leaving the ink lines as long as possible. The next step is to start to do some modelling, and this is also done with the green stone. So I'm looking at the subject matter, deciding which bits stick out, in essence, uh, and those are the bits that I engrave more deeply into the glass. Uh, it's very, very broad, it's quite loose, but it gives me a really good foundation for the other tools to work into. Then I move across to diamonds, and I use the diamond to clean up, give myself a nice crisp finish, because one thing stones don't do is give a crisp edge. So I'm cleaning up and also adding extra detail, more definition. Um, and then once I've done that, I move to the polishers. Something as small as, a, as this little viola flower, uh, it's very difficult to find a fine enough polisher to polish accurate fine lines. So I over polish, I polish more than I need, um, quite broadly. And then I re-engrave in between the veins, the flesh of the plant to leave the polished lines. And once I've done that, that's given me the colour variation. I then need to use polish for shadows. And that's what's happening here on the right. So I've introduced some very soft polish to actually shape the plant and give some suggestion of the trumpet disappearing inside and the polish in the stem so that it drops down behind the flower. I hope that all makes perfect sense. Doubtless, <laughs> if it doesn't, you'll tell me later. Um, so I started um, really making botanical studies because I have a passion for plants. Um, I'm quite a keen gardener and um, there are so many variations in plant form um, that to be frank I could do it all I could do it forever and still not get bored um, and they lend themselves to all shapes and sizes of glass this uh, erythronium was perfect for this very simple trumpet shape this is a lovely piece of glass with a decent lead content and this is a detail from a from a um, plate which is engraved top and bottom because obviously the nice thing about working on glass is that you can be economical, you can use both sides um, to, to overlay things. So this central section of this peony here is actually engraved on the front surface of the glass, whilst the rest of the flower head is on the back, um, which creates quite an interesting optical illusion. From plants, inevitably working as an engraver, one is asked to introduce lettering into um, commissions. And I love putting lettering on things. Uh, I wasn't trained in lettering, um, but for me, it's simply an extension of drawing and it's about space and balance and shape. And this large comport um, was a pure piece of self-indulgence. I wanted to do something about allotments for a very long time. And uh, I decided that I would do an allotment ABC um, for a guild exhibition some, some years ago now. Is it back engraved? So everything's drawn on the reverse of the glass. In other words, I've got to draw mirror style. Um, again, drawn with a spirit-based pen, very accurately, very precisely, leaving uh, as much um, definition as possible, and then engraved. And each letter has something that is appropriate for it. So the A has the allotment in it, the B has the borage, and so on, until you get to the bottom and on the foot, the Z has the gardener having a ziz. Occasionally I work with colour um, and this rather lovely piece of studio glass. Sadly, I have no idea who made it. I bought it from a gallery and they couldn't tell me, which is shameful really. But um, if anybody recognises the style, I'd be delighted to be told. It's about 30 centimetres in diameter across its broadest point. It's asymmetric and I made this piece for an exhibition at the Garden Gallery in Broughton, um, where I show quite often. Uh, and it's... Uh, um, the first lines of a poem by Alice Oswald, which I thought was rather lovely. It's called Ideogram for Green. 
and it says in the invisible places where the first leaves start green breathes growth um, and again i've used both sides of the bowl at the base so there's some of the hawthorn on the underside and some of the hawthorn on the top surface um, and uh, it was lovely to, lovely piece of glass to work on um, and great fun to, to design I also make pieces for um, outside and uh, again for the garden gallery and um, this is a combination of sandblast and drill engraving um, I've sandblasted the lettering and uh, the texture um, around the lettering here um, and I did a very basic um, sandblast for the figures and then worked into them very carefully with drill to build up their forms. I was very fortunate to be included by um, the rather wonderful and sadly late Michael Nathan, um, whom I know you all know, knew very well and miss greatly, and he uh, invited me to be part of the Downing Street project um, and so I made a number of pieces to contribute to that and these are just three um, three of them um, because uh, I developed an interest in engraving architecture and Michael knew that um, and was very very kind to invite me to be part of the whole thing it was quite a challenge because the shapes chosen by Downing Street didn't necessarily lend themselves terribly well to architecture. Um, so there was a there was a deal of muttering about working complicated architecture on curved surfaces. But, you know, it's good. It's all grist to the mill. Um, it's fun to sometimes play with perspective and um, that's something that I've been doing a fair amount of in recent years. This is a celebration of Sissinghurst, which again I made as a pure self-indulgence self really. It was for a guild exhibition and again it's back engraved um, and I've used the base so there's some engraving on the underside of the foot. You're actually looking at the underside at the moment because this is on my, on my lap in the studio. Um, so you're seeing the, di the, the side that I'm working on, um, and this is the design on the glass. And then just a few details of the finished article. It's quite fun to try and um, get the gist of a place uh, by bringing together the elements that I enjoyed the most. Um, and there were so many it was difficult to choose but but the obvious things were were um rita's rita's tower uh, sorry vita's tower and harold's cottage um and then there's there's vita's scythe and rake um and this is obviously the white garden um and the gateway um what else we got we've got the nuttery we've got the orchard so i've ma I managed to squeeze in a fair amount into a bowl which is um approximately 34 centimeters across we have a a, a garden that we love to visit down in devon a place called colliston fishacre uh, which is um, looked after by the national trust now and uh, i had this rather lovely piece of dartington it's a nice heavy uh, asymmetric shape um, and I decided to celebrate Colliston Fishacre on this bowl. So you've got the view uh, that we get when we are arriving um, down the drive, which is something that we're very familiar with and very fond of. And then looking across the other side of the bowl, elements from the garden. So the real the steps, which my daughter used to enjoy as a small child, disappearing off into the bamboo jungles uh, and so on and so forth. Heraldry. Uh, is something else which I've been drawn into as an engraver and this is a piece which I made for the Keatley Trust. Uh, you may recognise the goldsmith's arms. Um, I love the challenge of heraldry because it's very precise. Um, I, you know, the, 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 the business of getting the grounds, the detail, um, uh, but also the, the fact that you can have some fun with the mantling and, um, and with the motto and make it slightly your own and, and the herald, heraldic beasts are an absolute joy to uh, to engrave this is an orophore decanter um, so 
obviously very good uh, to work into and lovely to display. Small is beautiful. This is a, a piece which I made for an exhibition celebrating uh, the late Stephen Gottlieb, who was a wonderful lute maker, and his widow asked a number of members of the Art Workers Guild, of which he had been master, um, if they would make a piece celebrating him and his work. Uh, and then there was an exhibition um, to celebrate Stephen's life. And I made this little cube, um, and it was a sort of double double gift really, because the cube had belonged to past master Josephine Harris, who was sadly no longer able really to engrave anything. So she contributed the glass, and um, I engraved the piece, which has got various of Stephen's tools included in it. And I discovered that he had got some lute strings um, and they were supplied by a company called Absolute Perfection. So I engraved the Absolute Perfection on the base and you get all these wonderful um, refractions and reflections playing around in, in, the, um, in the cube. It's tiny, it's only about uh, 10 centimeters square. Um, overlay. This is a very fine piece of glass, very thin, almost like porcelain. It was blown by David Weeks. It has a very, very thin band of green around the outside edge. And this was a commission to make a piece cele um, to celebrate uh, or respond to the Annunciation. Um, it was a, a commission from someone who'd written a very uh, weighty tome uh, on the subject. And um, he, gave, he gave me a, 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 a sort of free, free reign. It was really my response. Um, to the story and um, the colour is very thin, the glass is very thin so um, I, I'd not really got a, a very very far to go before I hit the clear but but I was able to get a little bit of definition into some of some of the um, some of the areas. I don't work with colour very often but um, it is fun when I get the chance. So drill, we've talked about burrs, um, this is a window at Hurstbourne Tarrant um, in Hampshire, uh, in St Peter's, and as you can see it was celebrating the millennium, um, and they're about a metre tall, each one. They're engraved on low iron glass, they're engraved on the inner surface so that they're protected from the weather. Uh, they look out uh, from the corner that's used for the Sunday school uh, to the churchyard, so that's very clever lighting by Nick Carter when he went to take the photographs for me. Uh, he managed to light the bank behind, um, which I thought was utterly brilliant. Um, and it was it was an interesting commission. It's all done with a the drill. There is there's nothing else used in it at all. Um, and at this point in time, I was beginning to get large scale work, and it became rapidly apparent that I was going to need to think about possibly working in other ways um, and moving onto not not exclusively and with not leaving behind my burrs but using some broader techniques the first of which was um was to start to work with some sandblast um i pop this in this is this is my other workshop where i have a i have a slightly strange shaped drawing wall um and i can just about fit um drawings on there this this was a little bit overly overly large for the wall i had to fold it and move it up the wall eventually but um generally speaking i can fit a, a pair of doors on on this wall um to to work but as you can see i have to be off a off, off a ladder quite a lot of the time and here's an example of me working at Nero Glass Designs, um, which is where I go when I am working on a large scale using sandblast and or acids, uh, which is where we get to the blasts and the bites. Um, and you can see this is working on a very different scale to working on the tiny cube for past master Stephen Gottlieb. This is much, much broader brush stuff. So I've had to learn how to cut stencils. Um, the plaster is an occupational hazard, happens a lot, um, and um, it's quite, f I, I find it fascinating. Um, every time I cut a stencil, I'm reminded by uh, of something that Josephine said to me many moons ago, which was that there are two sides to every line, and that is certainly true with lettering. You get the wrong side of line and suddenly you've lost the balance of your letter, and I know that's my cost. 
Um, but um, working with a scalpel is interesting and um, as you can see the resulting outtakes can be quite fun too. Using sandblast has um, meant that I've had to learn about lots of different resists so I work with straightforward cut uh, stencil, hand cut stencils but I also introduce various kinds of resists. Use quite a lot of PVA glue which can be applied with brushes sponges, bubble wrap, my daughter's old terry toweling nappy, um, all sorts of things. You get some really interesting results um, using these kinds of resists. And I've learned all of this um, from this gentleman here on the right. Um, this gentleman here on the right is, um, is Dave Blackwell. And Dave Blackwell has been um, decorating glass uh, since he was, I believe, 14 and a half years old, he is now 74 um, and he does still do some, not so much these days, but he has been an absolute joy to work with. He's taught me so much in the last 20 years and this is his very favourite sandblaster. As you can see, it's rather tired, uh, very ancient. Um, it's a bit taller than I am to give you a sense of scale, which doesn't help you because I'm sitting at a computer desk, but I'm about five foot four, I suppose, or I was once. Um, uh, it's very acme. He's got a sheet over the top because when he turns the compressor on, it all shoots out to the top. Uh, this enormous gun, um, which requires two hands to hold it. And if you're not awfully careful and, and the air pressure's wrong, it's like some kind of unwieldy snake, um, which flies around all over the place. Um, we have a big slot through which we can sort of move up and down uh, and there's a frail inside which will take anything up to about three, three meters length. They do sometimes have larger pieces in there but it's, it's difficult um, to get anything much bigger in there. So I've, I've actually been able uh, in more recent years to do the sandblasting myself which has been quite fun. He's always looking over my shoulder to make sure I'm doing it right. He's also taught me how to use black and foil. And this is a little uh, section of uh, a, a roundel, which I made a while ago um, for a local church. Um, you may very well know what black and foil is. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm preaching to the converted, um, but just in case you don't, uh, it's a process whereby the glass is painted with a blacking, which is like a sticky tarry substance. That dries, it's then covered with beeswax, um, and then the lead foil, the back of which is also covered with beeswax, which is rubbed down, is then laid over the top of the, of the blacking and beeswax on the glass and rubbed well down. And then you can cut it away with a scalpel. And then you clean out the sections that are revealed so that the acid can access them. Um, and this is just one way of, of um, making a resist for acid. Uh, we're going to have a look at a couple of others in a minute, but you see, you have to be you have to be very careful because anything that's exposed, any small overcut, the acid will find its way in. If the edge of the glass is not protected, then the glass will fume because the acid accesses it. Um, so it, it's it's slightly um, unpredictable stuff, but fun, to, very much um, fun to work with. I'm currently working on this project. This is a little pair of windows for a church on the Isle of Wight. Uh, chancel windows and um, I thought I'd just pop this on this in because it gives you some idea of what goes on behind the scenes.
here is the acid shop. It's not the most pleasant place to be. This is Raymond, uh, who is the acid technician. Um, he's um, an absolute dab hand with, with the beeswax and tallow, which is what this is here. Uh, he's mixing it up to make it nice and soft and fluid, and he's going to build a fat wall around the outer edge of the glass to hold the acid in. It's sort of like making a moat, in effect. Um, the benches are slatted. Uh, he puts wedges underneath. When he breaks the, the wax wall away, then he can use a hose to hose off the acid. And there are gullies to either side where everything's washed away and it's stored and then removed um, by a special uh, chemical company. Um, but even so, the air is circulated every two minutes. You can see what it's doing to the metal. It's fairly dire stuff, but it is miraculous what it does to glass. Um, and just as a for instance, this is a large, uh, well, this isn't a large drawing. This is a drawing, a design proposal for a church window, west window. Um, and um, I've used sandblast and acid and drill. So I use all three mixed in together to produce the finished product. This is it in the acid shop. You can see the fat wall there. Uh, you can see where I've been painting, which is what I was doing in that short video clip. Um, it's lovely because it's it's free and soft and you can get some really interesting results with it. Um, and you can see there's a section of my working drawing beside it to uh, give, my, give myself the guide. Um, you can see also some blacking where I've actually cut away sections. That's the blacking pots. There's a selection of my brushes. Um, large canister of white spirit and a very important coffee mug at the back there. Um, and this is uh, a, a section of the same window. This is the sandblasted form. You can see where I've modelled it, lifted sections, blasted it, lifted another section, blasted it, um, and then starting to work with the drill, building up the textures and the softening off of the tone. Sandblast is marvellous, it's a broad brush, but it's not necessarily um, great at giving you fine detail. You need to add that in afterwards. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. You can see this is actually an acid ground, that's a white acid ground, which I sandblasted on top of. And then on top of that, I start to use my drill to introduce the variants. And there it is installed. I also introduced some gilding into this um, quite simply because I've repeated the, the quotation to be read from inside and out, um, which is something I quite I quite enjoy doing, um, playing with the lettering to make it a, in, an interesting pattern as well as something that um, has depth and meaning. I'm keeping an eye on the time because I know that uh, you don't don't like me to speak too long. So rapidly on uh, a small section of um, a screen for the church in Winchester St. Lawrence's. Um, I was asked to use this quotation uh, by G George Herbert and it seemed quite appropriate to pop this in this evening for you. Um, again, it's a combination this this project of um, sandblast, acid and drill work. Uh, the swallows are, are produced using what's called an acid sink. So their shape is cut and lifted um, so that the glass is exposed within that section. And then they sit under acid, which is brushed every five minutes. So in other words, it's disturbed every five minutes because as the acid works on the glass, it creates a sediment which settles onto the surface of the glass and reduces the efficiency of the, of the fluid. So by brushing it every five minutes and disturbing it, it means the acid can access the glass more and it actually sinks the shape that you're after creating into the glass. Uh, it's quite an interesting, interesting process and it gives a lovely surface to work on. And there is the finished article. The brief was to um, create something which would have appeal to children uh, which would frame the view of the East End and um, which would draw people in off the street um, because the street, the door to this church is open under normal circumstances um, all through the year and uh, people can see this as they walk past. So it's a sort of a lure, if you like, 
they're being allured by my allure. That's the theory anyway. Just in case you thought I only did churches, I don't only do churches. This is a section of a screen um, uh, at, at the top of a staircase, um, a balustrade, I suppose it would be more accurately described as, for a children's hospice just outside Winchester, a place called Jack's Place, which um, is set up to look after adolescents, really, uh, and people into their early 20s. Um, and I was asked to create a river of life um, and so this river of life, it, there are five panels in all. I've just popped two in to show you um, the kind of texture and, and detail. Um, but it starts uh, on the hills, the chalk hills. And so there are, there are things from the chalk hills and then the, the stream travels right the way through from the, from the source to the sea, down to the Solent. And I included a place, because the place is called Jack's Place. Can't resist a bit of a play on words. And finally, a small scale panel, which shows combining sandblast and drill on a much, much smaller scale. Um, this was a piece that I made for an exhibition uh, celebrating the foundation of Hyde Abbey 900 years ago. It's a bit more than that now. Um, Hyde was, was, uh, is the place where I live. And once upon a time before Henry VIII came along, there was the most magnificent and enormous abbey on the site, um, which uh, was about on the scale of uh, the existing cathedral um, and had the most wonderful scriptorium and some fabulous things, including a cross which was given to the abbey by Canute, um, a magnificent gold cross, which was destroyed when, when the abbey was sacked. It was sacked on more than one occasion before Henry got his hands on it. Um, and we were asked as local artists to produce a piece um, which um, was inspired by Hyde Abbey. And I am very struck by medieval manuscripts and um, the medieval manuscripts that ex still exist that were, were made at Hyde Abbey uh, are quite exquisite. And so I, I went for a walk um, in my local park, which is just at the end of my garden. And I was struck by the skateboarders, the young skateboarders, and their extraordinarily balletic um, and skillful maneuvers uh, both on skateboards and on their BMX bikes um, and uh, I suddenly thought you know the monks had a lot of fun with their manuscripts they used to poke fun at people who weren't too keen on and include them in all sorts of hellfire and damnation I should do the opposite I shall celebrate our our young friends and also their graffiti and so if you look very closely into the letters, you will see that there is graffiti included. And this is a graffiti that I found on their skateboard ramps that they had um, made themselves. And it, some of it was truly beautiful, uh, including, I rather like this one, bless this mess. And then um, another one, dear God. It didn't say anything else, just dear God, uh, which I thought was rather nice. And somewhere, uh, I can't quite remember where, there was on and on and on and on. And I wasn't quite sure there was on and on or no and no and no. But um, if it had been me on a skateboard, it would certainly have been the latter. Um, thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Absolutely lovely. Fantastic, Tracy. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure. I was definitely skilled as an artist as well. Paul, as... you're uh, muted, Paul. Paul, Paul, <laughs> you're there muted. There we are. Right. <laughs> Just by way of a little memory um, for you, Tracy. Um, just have a look at this picture that I funnily found yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we know who the centre person is. Indeed. <laughs> so much, much missed. Yes, indeed. Um, but, but yes, absolutely fascinating. And I also understand that um, there are some conversations about a new glass installation at, at the glass sellers church. Hello. What's <laughs> <laughs> happening? 
Build we'll fall with confidence, absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that, that's something that we're going to be watching very, very carefully. We're looking forward to seeing what, uh, what might develop at St. James Garlic Hythe. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Some, some things. Anybody got any questions? Mm -hmm. I'm amazed uh, that the, your ability. Uh, how long have you been doing this, Tracy? Uh, 41 years. Oh, right. <laughs> well, one, wonderful skill. Thank and you. It, and it shows so well on the screen. Um, mm. I was a bit late in coming, but uh, I do, I am, I'm delighted to have seen you and seen what you can do. Thank you very Thank much. You. Mm. In our words, you were, you were always held on a pedestal as the <laughs> god of blessing. <laughs> oh, so anytime, that's that's anytime true. That's true. <laughs> it was referenced to your work. So, oh, bless yes. You. But beautiful work. Thank, Thank you, Barbara. Mm. How do you cope with the transition between a elaborately intricately carved 10 centimeter cube and a three meter high window that must uh, be quite a challenge yeah it is a challenge i think i think that's i think that's probably part of its appeal because it means that i am i'm constantly having to rethink how i work uh, and also you know physically it's quite interesting because sometimes i'm crawling about on a bench on a glazing bench um, and other times I'm up a ladder or sitting at, at the workbench. So you know, it's, it's variety is the spice of life. <laughs> Very um, impressive. Tracy, um, Stephen Pullman asked, have you ever tried stippling? Um, yes, I have a little bit uh, and I do teach stippling to beginners. Um, I, I enjoy it I, and I sometimes incorporate it into other things. But I'm certainly not adept at it. I hope that answers Stephen's question. Anybody else got a question? A quick bit of name dropping. I used to know a wonderful glass engraver called Admiral Frank Grenier. Oh yes, Frank. Yes, no, Frank. Oh, do you? Is it? How is he doing? I think he's all right. Last I heard, he was okay. He must be a bit old. <laughs> he's, he's yeah, he's getting on a bit. He's a bit long in the tooth. He's still working though. Where is he? Right. I've got a couple of little bits of him because he, I used to be clerk for Painter Stainless Company and he was a keen supporter of the Painter Stainless uh -huh. and used to exhibit with them. But um, he's an example of somebody who's got nothing better to do sitting in a submarine than a <laughs> <laughs> submariner. <laughs> There's something wrong with the submariner as well, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Very important, Admiral. I should, I should, I should tell you. Uh, I had a very interesting conversation because I'm working at Nero's at the moment, and uh, and their young, their youngest recruit um, has been. He's been there a while now, but he was watching me work the other day, and he suddenly said to me, "Have you ever had a proper job?" Ever <laughs> <laughs> had a problem? Yeah. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Did you, did you train as a graphic artist before tackling glass engraving, or I mean, your drawing skills are obviously quite good? Um, no, I didn't. I did. I did a combined degree in English literature and fine art. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of. I did a lot of drawing. Uh, and actually, it was because of my drawing tutor at university that I ended up going to Josephine's class because he was he was watching me work. And I was uh, everybody else was being given given six inch wide paintbrushes and a large canvas. And I was sitting in the corner with a pencil and a sketchbook. Um, and he just said, I think you should go and try this out. I think you'd find it interesting. And uh, I went and I tried it. And that was it. I was hooked. That was when you got the glass bug, was it? That's when I got the glass bug. I was 19, yeah. Wow. Well, can I ask, Tracy, wonderful uh, collection of things you've seen. Absolutely stunning. What is the largest piece that you have uh, engraved or worked on? 
Um, I've uh, I engraved the the front of uh, a new parish meeting room at Chiddingfold, and it's 15 metres across. Oh wow! Um, so that was quite. And I my heart slightly sank when I was talking to the client. She was commissioning it in memory of her late husband, and she said to me, "He loved wild grasses." <laughs> so it is it's 15 meters of wild grasses and buttercups <laughs> and I, <laughs> it took a long time <laughs> oh, I've got 15 mm. minutes. you charged by the year when you're <laughs> no, she was she was a delight to work for are you uh, are you aware of a guy called um peter hazeldean no Peter Hazeldean is a glass architect and does a lot of church work mm -hmm. and does a lot of infilling of arches and um, creating sort of enclosing spaces to, uh -huh. for, for things. Um, I, I'll send you the link. He's Ion, Ion Glass, I think he is. Um, he did do a lecture for us earlier last year. Mm -hmm. um, I'll try and remember to send you the um, the presentation because Thank some you. of the work that he's done within the churches could be very apt as contacts for you. Mm. Um, that would be very very interesting. The other thing, of course, is that I don't know if you're aware of the facilities that are aware at, that are available at um, Dedalian Glass. No. Nope. Right, because um, I put um, Alison Kinnaird in touch with them. Mm -hmm. um, because they've got places to actually lay down large sheets because Alison's done a couple of pieces I think they were three or four meters high mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they were more than that but anyway um, I'll, I'll do that I'll send you the links thank you things It'd be interesting to, to things I think the networking is most important that mm. you, um, available facilities and things like that so Lucy, very, very can good. I ask a question yeah uh, um, quite a few other engravers, when they're coming to do big architectural pieces, often collaborate. Have you ever collaborated with another artist? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. That's, uh, it's not, not, not that it wouldn't, it's just never arisen. Okay, yeah. Why, have you got a proposal, Catherine? No, no, I, I'm too terrified to do anything more than six inches across. Tracy, <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't by any chance do the glass doors in the city church of St. Vidast, did you? No. no. I don't know who did. So. I think that's David Peace and Sally Scott. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Amazing. Oh, it's quite different. Yeah. Tracy, you, have you got a you. secret stash of large white Arkansas or white Arkansas, or do you have a secret supplier? Because I haven't been able to get my hands on those for years. I looked at them with glee too. <laughs> <laughs> well. um, Envy. Envy. I've got two left. <laughs> they're, they're, to be honest with you, they are old. I've had them a yeah. very long time. I thought so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we need. We need. We do need to find a source because uh, I was. I was teaching at the weekend and I was talking to the students about them and and I lent them a couple of mine. And, oh, uh, oh, you're brave. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they were saying, you know, where can we get them from? And I said, honestly, at the moment, I really don't know. Basically, uh, can I? So uh, I, I mentioned to. Paul, that I was in the dental business, I might be able to help because I used to sell uh, burrs and uh, abrasives. Really? So, uh, so if you possibly through somehow let me know what kind of size you need, I might find I might look into that. And of course, the grits are very. I mentioned before the grits are very important. Yeah. Uh, yes. And it's... there are and there are other materials that. You, you're, you're in Ar why, why Arkansas? Why Arkansas? Mm. Well, it's fine, yeah. fine white corundum is the same yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's but in the dead, in deadless silicon dioxide, uh, silicon. Uh, oh, I've forgotten. No, I'm retired. It's aluminium oxide. Aluminium oxide. Aluminium oxide. Okay, but the, there are the, it was uh, became old fashioned in the dental industry, um, but I might be able to help if, if somehow we can get into contact. I can 
Which yeah, is the small, the polishing the small dental plates. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. yeah, the small ones are in abundance, but it's, yes, to get it's that the big very ones. large one. Yes. Well, how, how big are we talking about, approximately? About two centimetres long and at mm. least a, a centimetre wide diameter. If not more, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. This, it's, I'm, that doesn't sound like a big uh, deal. Well, it <laughs> is. <laughs> Can I suggest that you either email me at yes. the glass sellers, or you can pick up um, Catherine or any of the glass engravers that are on via their own websites. I'm very yeah. happy to infiltrate okay. and share. I, I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, and Catherine, I'm going to use you as an example now. We had a, we introduced some years, a few years ago at our Ravenscroft lecture to a gentleman by the name of um, Roger Smallbone. Oh, yeah. And mm. he was a fascinating guy. He is a consultant surgeon at Imperial College. Um, he... Kneebone. Kneebone, thank you. Kneebone. Um, <laughs> that's it, I knew I'd get it right. He, made, he makes <laughs> kitchens as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tracy. Oh. Um, the most inspiring thing that I found with him is he, he is very keen on sharing trades with others and one example which fascinated me was um, there was a, a, a specialist in kidney stones who had a huge machine to actually break um, a kidney stone in half to see the center and they had this big problem that every time they tried to break it open it shattered and they took the wonderful Catherine Coleman with a little plug-in 13 amp little machine sat on a table who took slivers off in her amazing craft of glass and suddenly produced for him a piece of this stone where he could see the center which had never been able to be achievable and the other thing he did was he got he got orthopedic surgeons to talk to stonemasons the instruments were the same but just different sizes Mm. But the problem was exactly the same, dealing with a very heavy uh, mass of substance that they had to shape. And so somebody like a dentist suddenly coming up with an answer is exactly what everybody should be doing, is yeah. seeing where the parity is between one craft and another. Um, it's, it's a shame, really, that the surgeons get paid so much more than our wonderful artists who are actually doing <laughs> <laughs> but the, our, the relevance our, obviously yeah. is somewhat different. As glass engravers, our problem is though that uh, dental plates and all that stuff are, are barely ever made anymore. And it was these larger scale tools that were so useful to glass engravers. Well, there's still a lot of engraving mm. on, on ceramics. Is uh, there? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Internationally, it's, uh, there's still a lot of Crown and Bridge work being done. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, just to tell you, Catherine, I've just had a, a set of, um, or not a full set, but some false teeth done exactly that way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. What with Tracy and her drill in your mouth? <laughs> 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 yes, I put a tattoo on one front tooth. <laughs> <laughs> and no, the they're not my front teeth, I might add. <laughs> but perhaps that's an idea. I'll send it to you, and you can. I'll send okay. it to all three of you. Can yeah. each do one? Oh, we can do graffiti on it. Yeah. <laughs> Tracy, this could be a sideline. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> be very profitable. <laughs> it could put. It could also put a new definition on smile. <laughs> it's also important for post mortems to identify more just by reading the name and address. <laughs> <laughs> This, oh dear. It really would be useful, Stephen, if you could help us with this. I'll, I'll look right. into it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes, you'd be you'd be terribly popular for a very very long time. She <laughs> <laughs> off our teeth with nervous bunnies. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, as you know, I'm in Israel, so I'm. Uh, but the uh, 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 delivery system is pretty good. Well, it, it's, okay. you know, if you email me and, um, and yeah, yeah, sure, contact, sure. I'll put everybody in contact. Sure. Um, and I think it's a wonderful way to, and I think this is the wonderful thing about these Zoom meetings is that we yeah. learn different things that we would not otherwise have learnt. And I think that's been very constructive. Um, I can't tell you how many things I've learnt about my collection because of the Zoom meetings, including from Catherine. 
<laughs> yes, Currently I, doing uh, research for me. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and yes, you've got the case mess thing to explore at the moment, I think. Yeah, I've got that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With Lee. Yes. <laughs> Well, I, I think we're at that sort of time where we hand over to the master class like seller. I think that uh, our allotted hour of Tracy's valuable time is nearly up. I would just point out that there's one question for you from Anels844. Um, do you teach summer schools or the like? What is that question in the chat? Um, I, well, I, I teach where I'm asked to teach. Um, so I've just done a weekend at Westing and uh, I teach an adult ed course and occasionally I do workshops for the Guild. So mm. I'm, I'm around. Were you at Westing last weekend? Yeah. Oh gosh, I was at Chichester Park. <laughs> <laughs> he was busy stealing Queen Mary Tudor's rosary from Arundel Castle, I think. <laughs> 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 I am now not going to share the profits with you. <laughs> it's amazing what our clerk gets up to. <laughs> I must find things up. Tracy, thank you yes, for spending yeah. an hour of your valuable time with us. I'm astonished by your skill, artistry, delicate workmanship, patience. I, I couldn't possibly do what you do. I would, my drills would be all over the place, my acid would spill everywhere, but to have that wonderful sort of delicate touch and patience to produce such intricate and fine work, and botanical work in particular, must be about the most difficult, I and mean, the, the intimate de details of plants and things. And what you showed us was absolutely beautiful, and so impressive, and you are so matter of fact about it. <laughs> <laughs> As if it's just something you do every day, which well, you Well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us couldn't. But thank you so much, both on behalf of the glass sellers, and if I may presume, on behalf of the members of the many other glass societies that have joined us. And thank you for joining us for this evening. I think we've had an absolute feast of artistry. So thank you so much, and let's put our hands together for Tracy. Uh, and on that note, I shall say that we're almost at the end. Next week, um, we have a gentleman by the name of Nigel Benson, who I think is with us tonight. Um, mm. We're going to be talking about the famous Whitefriars glass factory that was in the city of London for so many years and to this day okay. people still collect yeah. pieces of their glass so I send the details out over the weekend um, if you'd like to join us you'd be very welcome um, I'll send it to the various secretaries of the glass associations and on that note may you all have a very pleasant evening a nice glass of wine or off to your suppers if that's the case and guess what you have the joy of a bank holiday weekend with sunshine, I hear. Yes, all right. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Good night, everybody, and stay safe. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.